Anyone who has ever received a static shock has experience with one of the earliest tenets of electricity and magnetism. Like charges repel and opposite charges attract. This maxim describes the interaction between charged particles, or in other words, the effect of one charged particle on another. But what if we want to describe how a charged object impacts its environment regardless of any other charge? We are now delving into the concept of electric fields, a concept that pops up everywhere in our universe. James Clark Maxwell is the man who we credit for summarizing all that we know about electric and magnetic fields into four beautiful equations, which we refer to as Maxwell's equations. To get anywhere with Maxwell's equations, we must first understand what an electric field is, and for that, we'll go back to the interaction between two charges, in this case both positive. Common sense and experience tell us that these charges repel from each other. According to Isaac Newton, any change in an object's motion, that is, an acceleration, requires force. So we can deduce that some force exists between these two charges, which we'll call Fe, the electrostatic force. Newton's third law also tells us that every reaction requires an equal but an opposite reaction, so each charge exerts an equal but opposite force on the other. Let's think about what should affect this force. It makes sense that if we increase the charge of either of these two particles, we should expect a bigger force between them. It also checks out with our intuition that the further apart these charges are, the weaker we expect their interaction to be. We find that these two trends are perfectly summarized in Coulomb's law, which tells us that the force between any two charged particles is equal to the product of their charges divided by the distance between them squared. Notice there is also some constant of proportionality k. k, as we'll learn later, describes how electric interactions propagate through space and is likewise intimately related to the speed of light, but for now let's ignore it. For students of classical mechanics, this law should remind you of the universal law of gravitation, where the gravitational force between two objects is proportional to the product of the masses of the two objects divided by their distance squared. Such symmetries in physics are everywhere, but for now, let's get back to our charges. Let's say that we want to find the field generated by the charged particle little q. We can mathematically define field as the ratio of force to charge. So, the field generated by little q is the force that some other charged particle, for example big Q, would experience divided by the charge of big Q. Note that it doesn't really matter for our situation what the charge of big Q actually is. Electric field tells you the ratio of force to charge, so that ratio will stay the same no matter what big Q you pick. Therefore, to get from our force equation to the field generated by little Q, all we have to do is divide the force equation by big Q and our field pops out. Before we go on, there are two other important things to know about electric fields. For one, electric fields are a vector quantity. That is, they not only have a size corresponding to the size of the force per charge in a given field, they also have a direction corresponding to where a charge in the field will want to move. Secondly, electric fields obey the law of superposition. That means if we have two charges, the electric field in the area around the charges is equal to the sum of the electric field generated by both charges. Knowing both of these facts helps us to understand that an electric field vector tells us the size and direction of the force on a charge in that field. If the given charge was negative, the size of the field would be exactly the same, but the direction would be reversed. There are many ways we could try to visualize what makes an electrostatic interaction happen, which is actually a very hard thing to do. At the time that electrostatic interactions like these were first being studied, the physics community hated the idea of action at a distance. In other words, we thought that in order for one object to cause another object to move, they had to be physically touching each other. In an attempt to make this assumption consistent with electric fields, physicists proposed all kinds of crazy ideas, including an electric fluid that flows between charges and applies forces on them. That idea is obviously crazy, but unfortunately the only answer for what makes charges move is other charges. As far as we know, the electromagnetic force is one of the four fundamental forces of the universe, which still leaves us with the question, how should we visualize electric fields? It's time that we get formally introduced to a vector field, which is in my opinion the best way to visualize an electric field. 
The vector field is a type of graph that associates every point in the space around a charged object with the vector, which we know denotes the electric field. This vector tells us the size and direction of the force that a particle will experience at that point, if we know the charge of the particle. And with that, we now know enough about electric fields to move on to the good stuff.